Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Well, welcome everybody to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. And this is a double header today, folks. You get a special treat. This morning, we had Representative Sarah Vance from Homer, Homer talking about bycatch and, and a slew of other things that she's working on um, this session. And uh, I just want to thank everybody that listens, watches, and reads Must Read Alaska. We survive off of five, ten dollar, hundred dollar donations at a time. We are not funded by some nonprofit conglomerate. We're just funded by everyday Alaskans that care about conservative news. So if that is you, we want to thank you. And if you're wondering how to donate, just go to mustreadalaska.com and up on the right hand side there, there's a little donate button and you can just click on that and give $5 and we'd be very, very appreciative. But without further ado, I have a very special guest today, a friend of mine, Eli Porter. Now I want to tee him up a little bit because I think this is very exciting. Um, he is one of the owners of Snug Har Harbor, um, and he's going to be talking about Snug Harbor Outpost, and he's going to be talking to us about that. Now, folks that are listening, you could be in the UK, you could be in Australia, you could be uh, sitting in Canada. We have listeners all over the world. You need to literally stop what you're doing, and you need to go to snugharboroutpost.com, because this is one of the coolest destination uh, places that you could ever book a vacation with in Alaska. You are going to want to do this because my guess is it's going to be sold out quickly this summer, and you're going to be one of the, you're going to want to be one of the first folks to be able to book this summer. And if you live in Alaska, you're going to want to go book this as a inside Alaska vacation. Now we are not being paid by Snug Harbor Outpost. Uh, we just think it's amazing here at Must Read Alaska. So without further ado, welcome Eli to the Must Read Alaska show. John, thanks for having me, man. So, wow, what a what an introduction! I I, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate you. Here. Yep, glad you're here as well. And and Eli also happens to be one of our awesome teachers here in Nikiski. He is one of those teachers that you know you look back on, and kids remember those couple teachers that made an impact in their lives over the years. And Eli is one of those teachers, so I appreciate what you do at the high school as well, Eli. But tell us about Snug Harbor Outpost. Give us the history. We will go into kind of down the road here in a little bit, how you all became owners and some of the cool stuff you're doing there. But give our listeners a kind of sneak behind the curtain of the history of Snug Harbor Outpost. Okay. Uh, yeah, boy. Um, well, it all started back in, uh, <laughs> in 1908, actually. It was built as a, as a clamory. In fact, the guy that uh, built had it built is George Palmer, who who the town Palmer, Alaska, is named after, and oh, he wow. had it uh, set up as a cannery or a clamory, um, so it would pack clams uh, because it's in between a couple of great clam beds, um, and they chose that spot in particular because it's the only deep water port on that whole side of the Cook Inlet, and uh, I don't know how. It changed from a clamory to a cannery, but at some point it became a cannery because they were uh, they recognized there was a massive amount of salmon swimming through there. So um, the whole Cook Inlet region went to catching salmon through what are called fish traps. And, uh, you know, everybody knows where the salmon are heading to the stream. So they put a few traps out um, and it funnels the fish into a, a pen and they can pull all the fish out. And uh, so uh uh mr freebrock somehow uh re received the property from palmer and turned it into a cannery in the 60s i believe and nice. uh and it turned into uh, a thriving cannery and uh in fact the whole cook inlet almost got overfished because fish traps were so efficient so the canneries went to um drift gill netting which is a way you a different way to catch the same fish uh, with fleets of boats that go out and catch the fish. And uh, back then, the, the canneries owned their own fleet of boats. So you would, you know, you would come up and fish for them in the summer. So they 
pulling people from all over the United States to come up, fish the boat for a percentage. They would go out, catch the fish for the cannery, come back in and deliver. And that's kind of how canneries all over the state were popping up because they would they could have these fleets of boats in a remote location and they would house the whole population there for the whole summer. So it didn't need to be next to a town or anything like that. And that's kind of what we have going on here. We have a cannery that was built out in the middle of nowhere, just sort of popped up and uh, and it was built to house, you know, hundreds of people. So um, yeah, explain that a little bit to folks because, you know, there's going to be people listening that aren't from Alaska. They're like, oh, cool. They have like a, a couple tents in the woods. Yeah. So, you know, walk us through like this is like a it looks like a like small town if you were to see it from a helicopter. Yeah, exactly. So there are the main cannery buildings, which would look like what you might expect an old turn of the century cannery buildings to look like with tin siding and uh, all on pilings. And there used to be boardwalks going around from building to building. But then uh, beyond just the cannery buildings, there's there's the owner's house, which is a 12 bedroom house. And there's the bunkhouse, which is a 40 bedroom or 40 room bunkhouse that uh, is there. There's a, the wash house. There's the winter watchman's house. And uh, we're trying to come up with a better name for this, but uh, there's a house that, that was called the Filipino bunkhouse because back in that time, the Filipinos were uh, segregated from uh, the other people that were working in the in the cannery and uh so oh, there's wow. that house and i guess that house was actually the place that was the fun place the happening place back in the day those guys were always doing something fun it sounded like um you know there's all kinds of little buildings the generator house there's the store which was an old store that the fishermen used to be able to come in and um get you know canned food and maybe some frozen food uh and then um, up above that's an apartment for the bookkeeper and uh, there's a room in the back for the for the uh, you know the the very the, the VIPs of the cannery the the corporate corporate guys that would come in there's a little apartment there for them so just all kinds of buildings and little nooks and crannies that it's, it is and it was a small town at the time but um, you know just populated in the summer and uh, so uh, eventually uh, the cannery, um, the reason why they chose that location was the deep water port and it was also a lot of fresh water there. So um, they had that going for them, but ultimately the cannery met its demise because it wasn't in a town and there's lots of canneries that were in towns and in townships or close to them. And it became much easier just to, uh, the same fishermen could come into the same harbor, Snug Harbor, and deliver their fish, but to a fish tender, another ship instead of uh, them processing the processing the fish at Snug Harbor, they would take them all the way to Kenai and process them there. It ends up being a that brought their expenses way down, the way I understand it. So at some point, you know, uh, you and your family end up purchasing this. Tell us about that story. You always wanted to own a small city that is only yeah, yeah, no by boat. <laughs> no, you know, it, uh, actually, the cannery was the cannery that that my dad grew up going to and I and my brothers and I grew up going to we're commercial fishermen um, by history my grandfather was one of the first fishermen out here and uh, he delivered fish to that same cannery his son my dad grew up delivering fish to that same cannery and I bought a boat and permit and delivered fish to that same cannery and uh, uh, ultimately it went out of business and it was just sitting there for years and years and years and years and it was actually listed for sale but uh, for years, it was listed in the Nilchik, which is a whole different location. So anybody that, that didn't know the, the what it was would maybe go look looking for it, would never be able to find it. Anyhow, we uh, we got together, my brothers and my dad and my grandpa, and we thought, man, this would be a really really great place to to turn into something. It's got so much, and uh, we threw an offer. Uh, and to Ward's Cove Packing, and they accepted the offer. I think they were looking to get rid of it because, you know, they had to have a winter watchman there all the time, and it was just sort of a, a, a liability. I mean, it's a hundred year old buildings just sitting there on stilts, and you know, most of these canneries are falling down. You know, they're hard. It takes a lot of maintenance to keep up on. So, so we put in an offer. They accepted it, and since then we've been 
That was <laughs> 20 years ago, I think. We've been working on getting it fixed up, which is sometimes we feel like we're sliding backwards, but uh, it's uh, an amazing place and you know, a labor of love. We just love it over there and we're just looking forward to sharing it with other people. So tell me about the process of getting it from, okay, it's been, you know, it's been vacant forever. You guys buy it and then you get it to a place where now people can go rent rooms and do bear viewing and fishing trips. You know, what kind of blood, sweat and tears went into making the same yeah. be a destination? Well, first I have to say uh, a lot of great friends coming over to help us is the blood, sweat, tears. We have a, a group of friends that comes over every year and does a lot of work on the place. And that includes, you know, it, it has an old galley that, that was built to feed all of the, all of the workers. But um, ultimately, you know, you can imagine what kind of stoves and, and cooking equipment was in that galley. We had to gut all of that and put in a whole new commercial kitchen. We've gone through all the rooms in the, what we call the Freebrock house, which was the owner's house and uh, made mm -hmm. those into nice rooms for clients, put in a couple of bathrooms upstairs, a couple of bathrooms downstairs, did the same thing over in the apartment for the store gone through and renovated a lot of different rooms uh we we just this last summer um we almost got done building a sauna it should be ready this summer beginning of the summer um so a wood fire fired barrel sauna they used to have to contain all their water in in big dug fur 10,000 gallon tanks and we tore those down and built a sauna out of it and uh all the old boardwalks just rotten we had to pull all that up just so much so much that is continuing to that we have to do but it just can every summer it's just uh constant maintenance and uh renovate we always every year do something nice for nice for the cannery we go over and build something new and uh improve the what we have so uh last year we uh it was the sauna the year before that it was going into the free rock house and doing up some rooms and uh, making sure they're nice and this this crew that we have that comes in is just amazing. They're all professionals in their trades and and so they know what they're doing. And they come in and show me how to do some of these things that would take me forever. You must have some pretty awesome friends. I right? have some I have some friends like every year I'm like, how I mean what can I do to help you out here, or repay you? And there's they're just such nice people. They the so shout out to the Absher crew. They're they're amazing. They do the great people. So, so walk me through, let's say somebody books a destination vacation with you. What does it look like for that person? They fly into home or tell me about kind of some of the experience yeah. that people can have. There's, there's two ways to get to the island. You can fly or you can boat. There's no roads. Um, so we have this one package that we have coined bears, butts, and a bed. And uh, you come into Homer and you get on our boat, the eye of the storm and uh, we're going to take you out of Ketchmack Bay and take you across to Snug Harbor, which is about a 60 mile trip. And on the way, you'd get a halibut charter out of that. And once you get there, we're going to get to the beach, have some fun on the beach and uh, eating good food and uh, get settled into the cannery. Then we're going to take you or into your rooms. And then we're going to, we're not going to just put you in the cannery. We're gonna you're going to, you're going to put them to work. <laughs> yeah. To work. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then we're going to head up and we're going to go see the bears wherever they're at. So June through mid July, the bears are eating sedge grass up at the head of the bay and they're just in there thick. You know, it's uh, one of the, I ran into the, the head of the park service there a few years ago. So we're in the middle of Lake Clark National Park and I ran mm -hmm. into him and he said, this area here is one of the highest bear concentrations in the world for wow. coastal brown bear. So we're gonna see bear and uh, just in a, I just have to say, it's also just a spectacular setting with mountains jutting in and out of the ocean and waterfalls coming down and, and bears running around everywhere doing their thing. And so we're gonna see some bears, we're gonna catch halibut. Uh, and then um, we've got an island called Duck Island there, and it's just full of seabirds coming, uh, you know, puffins, cormorants, eider ducks, oyster catchers, eagles. Uh, and it's, I'm not a birder by, uh, you know, I know some people really just get into it and my instincts aren't for that. But when I go to this island, it's just amazingly, uh, it's, it's, you can't help but be in awe of just the biology that exists on this island. And then uh, come back, take a sauna, 
Uh, maybe the next next day includes some more bear viewing or going up to the crescent to do some fishing. Um, just a lot of explore exploring we've had to do in the area to find out where we can get to and what we can't get to. And uh, we've just found out some really just some gems in the area. Uh, the the Crescent River mouth is just an amazing place. Also, salmon just swimming up and bears down there fishing at the at mid to end of July and uh, get people on fish and bears at the same time is always a fun experience. Or you could fly in. So uh, what we're starting this year is we're flying people in, doing day trips, go up see the bears, come out have a onto the uh, out to the cannery after we see the bears and do like a we call it a salmon bake out on the beach and have a nice dinner salmon bake um, after you've been out viewing bears all day and uh, take a sauna, maybe relax around a fire. The next morning you wake up, have a good breakfast, and then we fly out. So that's just a one day trip. And we can turn oh, that nice. into a two-day trip, but uh, um, the one day seems to be really popular now. Um, just a quick, and and for about the same deal that you could just go do a day of bear viewing, we take you over to the cannery, do the salmon bake overnight, and, uh, do the sauna. It's just kind of a neat Alaskan experience. And I guess that's, John, what I would, if, if there's anybody out there listening, like, why should you go here versus somewhere else is, this is, this is our home, you know, this is uh this is a place that we grew up going to and we love it and we want to share it. And uh, we feel like we have a unique thing going here that is unusual. And uh, it, it sort of is a little bit of a taste of everything that Alaska has to offer is what we feel. So that's awesome. So, you know, my guess is one of these days, some uh, fancy magazine in New York City or somewhere over there is going to pick up something that you're doing and your place is going to be the place to go to because it is talk about an Alaskan experience for somebody. They can fly in, you know, get every meal prepared and done for them. It sounds like go on a bear viewing trip, go on a salmon thing, go on a bird watching trip and literally be right on the beach and experience Alaska every day. So I think you've kind of hit a sweet spot there and I hope that you have success this summer. But what is the ultimate dream for you all? Are you going to, is it kind of built to where you want it now, or you, or is there rooms down the road or a lodge or, you know, what's the dream pie in the sky idea for this? Yeah. Pie in the sky um, that we have fairly large groups of people there at a time, 40 people, maybe something like that. And, uh, but they're all going to doing their own adventures in groups of six to 10 people. Uh, you know, you want to bring your family up and do something in Alaska. You come in, but you don't want to be in the, in the crowds. Well, you come to you come to Snug Harbor, you go out on your your daily adventure, and you're kind of doing it on your own. You're not around a big group of people, but then you come back that evening to a fire and a sauna and a good dinner in the banquet hall. And there's people that it, from all over the world that have been doing their adventures for the day, and you're sharing stories and meeting new people, and it being sort of a hub, uh, you know, an outpost for Lake Park National Park, being a place where people can come to, even people that have their own boats ultimately. Mm -hmm. Right now, it'd be really hard, difficult for us to do, but uh, in the future, we would love to have, you know, even people that are just exploring on their own be able to come in and get some food and maybe a bed and uh, and a room and uh, enjoy Snow Harbor that way. So just people coming from all different places in different ways, having things going on. Yeah, we're definitely not done yet. We want to keep expanding and uh, uh, turn it into a place that, uh, you know, respects Snow Harbor for the amazing outdoor place that it is but that is also a place where people can come to feel comfortable and experience being um out in in true nature with in alaska with all the animals and and, and things that go with it so uh but also have a little taste of comfort that's our goal well i think that's awesome what you know there's going to be people listening to this that maybe they want to start their own business maybe they're in the middle of starting their own business what for you, Eli, has been a driving force to keep going? Because you obviously don't need to do this. You have a full-time day job. Yeah. You help with sports and you do all these kind of things and your family's really involved. Um, what's advice you'd give to somebody that is thinking about, you know, starting their own business? What keeps Eli going at the end of the day? Well, I, the same thing I would tell my students, you know, if, if you enjoy doing something, then, then pursue that. And, um, you know, my brother and my dad and my our wives and we're all very passionate about the outdoors and Alaska and 
it's uh, it's something that we love to be a part of. So my advice to uh, to anybody that wants to pursue something is to, or, or they're interested in anything, I mean, is to pursue it, go for it. And uh, for me, it's it's always good to have, yeah, you need to have another income maybe, but you, but go for it, make things happen. And um, I just, I, I can't see not, we get to, we get this one turn around this earth and I, I can't see not, not chasing after your dreams and what your goals are. And I, for us, it's getting people over to see places that they wouldn't normally get to see. I think people coming down to the end of Catch Mac Bay might get a little disappointed when they get to the end of the road and they want to go across over there and there's a bunch of people right there and maybe they want to get out. We want to provide that for people. And if you have a dream that interests you, and I think the key is a dream that includes other people, then that's just going to make the world better. So that's awesome. So let's say you're sitting on a beach with your family 30 years from now, <laughs> dipping on a Mai Tai. What do you want Snug Harbor Outpost to be remembered by? I would like it to be remembered as a place that you came to and you didn't feel like you were just a number that you felt like we were friends and that uh, maybe even some family. Uh, we've got so many people that have come up that that leave and we stay in touch and, you know, we hug and we kiss. <laughs> they just become part of the family, you know. Um, so uh, maybe I shouldn't have shared hug and kiss, but. <laughs> <laughs> so how does somebody tell us the deets on. You're going to have people listening to this that are like, how do I book? Where do I book? Who do I call? What who? What person can I email? Give us all those details. Yeah. Uh, well, um, so you can go to our website, snugharboroutpost.com, snugharboroutpost.com. I know that's a mouthful, um, but you can go there and it, you can click book now or contact us. And the number to call would be area code 513-600-2904. And that is actually my sister-in-law, Mariah, and she's waiting to to book right now or any time that you want to call. She's super cool. We, I hit, uh, I hit, hit uh, sister-in-law gold when my brother married her. So um, she's awesome. She's super friendly and she'll hook you up. You know, she'll, she'll get things worked out for you. And that's the thing is we'll work with you to help you set up the schedule that you want for a great Alaska experience. And it doesn't have to just be our place. You know, if you want to make us one stop and you want some advice on some other things, then Mariah is a great resource. Awesome. Well, Eli, I really appreciate you joining the Must Read Alaska show, and we wish you nothing but success here from the Must Read Alaska show to Snug, Snug Harbor Outpost. We will put the link in the uh, podcast description of this episode so folks can uh, just click on the link. And if you're just joining us in the last five or 10 minutes, I want to encourage you to go back and uh, listen to the whole thing on Facebook Live because you're going to want, you're going to, want to hear from Eli in one of the coolest places that you can visit in Alaska. If you are living in Alaska, and you want a in Alaska vacation, Snug Harbor Outpost is the place to look at. And if you are in the lower 48 or the UK, Canada, Australia, something like that, and you're looking for a one of a kind destination Alaska vacation, Snug Harbor Outpost is your meal ticket. So thank you so much, Eli, for joining us on, on the Must Read Alaska show. We wish you nothing but success. And until next time, I'm John Quick signing off from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks, John. Yeah.